Good morning, everyone. I greet you all in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God in Romans chapter 8, verse 39, it says, Nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in this all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How fortunate and how privileged we are that no circumstances, no situation around us can separate us from the love of God. So even as we worship our God this morning through this online service, let's all be reminded of the great sacrifice and love our God has done for us. Shall we all unite our heart and look to God in prayer. Our God, we thank you so much for this morning that you've given to us. Thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, and for your faithfulness. Thank you so much, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity that you've given to us once again to worship you through this online service, Lord. I pray for all the participants, Lord. May their participation be a blessing for each one of us who witness this uh, service, Lord. I especially would like to pray for our speaker, Reverend Paras, even as he delivers the word of God to us this morning, I pray to you that, Lord, you will use him as your mighty instrument, Lord, so that, Lord, through him, we all will be blessed richly, Lord. Thank you so much for this time, committing each one of our lives and entire service into your loving hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. NCF, I hope you all are doing well. Well, in times of joy, in times of need, in times of our brokenness, and the darkest hours of our lives, we need Jesus. And at this time, many of us may be looking around and question, where is God? May this fact encourage us all that God is faithful. Let us take this time to discipline and to train ourselves into looking upward and seeking His face because regardless of whatever circumstances that we are facing right now, God is faithful and He is sovereign. Let us all sing this song together, Lord, I need you.
Let's pray for the offering. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for protecting our life during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for safeguarding our jobs, business, and financial situation. As a token of your love, we bring this small amount of money as the widow dropping a copper coin into the offeratory box. Accept our offering, tithes, thanksgiving, and donation. Bless the cheerful giver and also bless the money and use it for the extensions of your kingdom. For all these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The scripture portion for today is taken from Jeremiah chapter 32 verses 15 to 25. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Houses, fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch son of Meriah, I prayed to the Lord, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring the punishment for the father's sins into the laps of their children after them. O great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men. You reward everyone according to his conduct and as his deeds deserve. You performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day, both in Israel and among all mankind, and have gained the renown that is still yours. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. You gave them this land you had sworn to give their forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. They came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey you or follow your law. They did not do what you commanded them to do. So you brought, brought all this disaster upon them. See how the siege rams are built up to take the city. Because of the sword, famine and plague, the city will be handed over to the Babylonians who are attacking it. What you said has happened, as you now see. And though the city will be handed over to the Babylonians, you, O Sovereign Lord, say to me, Buy the field with silver and have the transaction witnessed. May God bless the reading and understanding of his word. Good morning. I want to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to thank God for this opportunity once again to share from God's word. If you have your Bibles with you, with you please keep them open to Jeremiah chapter 32. And we will be looking at a few verses from there. Shall we look to God in prayer before we turn to his word? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for this new day. We thank you, Father, that each new day reminds us of your grace and your mercy that flows into our life so freely. Father, we want to commit ourselves into your care. Father, as we turn to your word, as we meditate on it, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. And Father, that you would draw us closer to you. Father, that we would be transformed into the likeness of Jesus as we meditate on your word. And Father, we pray that we would be more than just hearers. Lord, you would give us the grace to do what you ask of us today. To that end, Lord, we commit each and every one of us in your hand. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. A.W. Tozer, uh, a great scholar, once made this statement. He said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What he was essentially saying is this, that how we perceive God, how we visualize God or our conception of God shapes the way we live in our highs and in our lows. How do we turn to God? What do we think or who do we think God is? And the answer to that question, who we think God is, will eventually shape the way we respond to life's certainties or uncertainties. We are living in a time when things are so difficult. 
We are living in a time when things are uncertain, when there is this fear of future. We have so many questions, so many doubts because of the COVID uh, pandemic that is spreading, whether it is to do with jobs, whether it is to do with salary cuts, whether it is to do with our own relationships, or whether it has to do with our own health. And in the midst of this, the question rises, who do we say God is? Do we think God is still on the throne? Can we say God is still in control of the affairs of the world? How we answer that question will largely shape the way we live our life out. The passage that uh, was read to us, Jeremiah 32, verses 16 onwards, is essentially Jeremiah's prayer uh, in which he affirms God's sovereignty in a very, very difficult time. Jeremiah himself was going through a, a, a period where there was a lot of uncertainty, where there was a lot of fear. And it is in the midst of that context that he affirms that the God he worships is a sovereign God. And I believe that in our own day and age, we need to rediscover God's sovereignty in our life. We need to discover God's sovereignty over the affairs of our world. You know, Jeremiah's own ministry was one that was marked by suffering. Jeremiah, in fact, is known as the weeping prophet uh, in the Old Testament because in his lot there was more pain than there was joy. And so what he has to say in these particular verses has direct bearing on our life and how we live our life. When you look at Jeremiah's prayer in Jeremiah 32, verses 17 onwards, Jeremiah refers to God as sovereign God twice. Verse 17, he says, Ah, sovereign Lord. He begins his prayer on that note of God's sovereignty. And again, when you read towards the end of that prayer, in verse um, 25, the last part, he again says, You, O sovereign Lord. So he boldly and confidently affirms that the God he worships is a sovereign God. What does it mean for God to be sovereign? In fact, Jeremiah himself answers that question in this prayer. In verse 17, the last part, he says, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. What does it mean for God to be sovereign? Simply this, that nothing is hard for God, that everything is possible for him. Chuck Swindoll, um, you know, when he defines God's sovereignty, he defines God's sovereignty in this way. He says, God is able to do what he pleases with whomever he chooses, whenever he wishes. God is able to do whatever he pleases with whomever he chooses, whenever he wishes. In other words, God has no boundaries. God cannot be put in a box. There is no limit. But our God is a God of possibilities. Now the context of the passage that we are reading is where Jeremiah has been asked to buy a piece of land. And he buys this piece of land. He goes through the legal proceedings of it. He uh, seals the deal, pays the money, does everything according to uh, the requirement of the law. And after he has bought that land, then in verse 17, Jeremiah says what he has to say. Now, what is the connection between buying a piece of land and God's sovereignty? You need to understand what was happening in Jeremiah's time. Jeremiah chapter 32 tells us that the king of Babylon had laid siege on Jerusalem. It was just a matter of time before the Babylonian army would invade, would enter Jerusalem, would destroy everything. And at a time such as this, it was almost foolishness to invest in real estate because there was no way Jeremiah would have been able to enjoy what he was going to buy. But when you read uh, chapter 32, verse 6 tells us that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was told very clearly by the Lord that your cousin, Hanamel, is going to come and he's going to sell a piece of land and you must buy it. Don't just buy it as a verbal transaction, the transaction, but buy it from a legal perspective. Do all the paperwork that is required. And the reason why God asked Jeremiah to do that is that Jeremiah would be giving a sign to people that though the situation is bad now, God is going to restore this land. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 32 itself, 
towards the end in verse 44, God says this through Jeremiah, fields will be brought for silver and deeds will be signed, sealed and witnessed in the territory. And so what God is telling Jeremiah is essentially this, that though the situation is bad now, remember I am sovereign. Though the king of Babylon and the uh, Babylonian army is a reality in your life right now, remember I am sovereign even over those present and clear dangers. And I think in our day and age, we need that affirmation, don't we? We need to be reminded that though there is so much uncertainty around us, the God we worship is a sovereign God. The God we love and follow is someone who is still in control over the affairs of this world. As Jeremiah affirms God's sovereignty, in his prayer, he makes reference to three aspects of God's sovereignty, which I believe are very, very important for us to be reminded of who God is and what he does for us. When you look at verse 17, Jeremiah gives us the first aspect of God's sovereignty. He reminds us of who God is. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says this, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth, and by your great power and your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. The first thing that Jeremiah tells us is this, that God's sovereignty is seen in his creation. God's sovereignty is seen in his creation. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. You know, when we look at our nature, when we look at the creation around us, we are reminded of who God is. We are reminded of how great God is. We are reminded of the awesome power that he wields when he brought everything that is around us into existence. Robert Wells has written this fascinating book. It's a children's book in which he takes us from concepts that we can understand to something that is beyond our understanding. And the book is entitled, Is the Blue Whale the Biggest There Is? Is the Blue Whale the Biggest There Is? And in this book, he goes on to say this. He says, you know, when you look at animals, the blue whale is one of the largest animal. It, uh, it, is, it, outnum it outsizes any other animal that we have on land or in water. But then he goes on to say, you know what? The blue whale is not really all that big because if you were to take a jar and put in 100 blue whales, a million of those jars would fit into the Mount Everest. And so he says when compared to Mount Everest, the blue whale is not all that big. But then he goes on to say, you know what? The Mount Everest is also not all that big because if you were to stack the Mount Everest one over the other, it would just be a fit whisker on the face of the earth. Compared to the size of the earth, the Mount Everest is nothing. But then he takes it even further and he says, you know what? The earth is not all that big when you compare it to the sun. In fact, a million earths could fit into the sun. And he takes it even further and he says, you know what? Even the sun is not all that big when you compare it to the medium red star, uh, is, when you compare it to the giant red star, Antares, you could fit in a 50 million suns into Antares. And then again, even the Antares is not all that big because when you compare it to the Milky Way, there are billions of such great stars. And then the Milky Way is also nothing when you compare it to the vast expansions of the universe. And he gives us this great concept of, you know, the greatness of everything that surrounds us. And when you turn to Genesis chapter one, verse one, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, from the blue whale to the vast expansion of the universe, everything God created merely by the power of his word. No wonder the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So often we forget who God is. So often we forget the power that he wields, the power that he has demonstrated in the creation that he has given us. And I think we need to lift our eyes 
to the hills, to the lakes, to the rivers, to the seas, and remind ourselves that the God we worship is a great and awesome God. That he who made everything out of nothing can take your life and my life with all the struggles, with all the problems, and make something good out of it, even when we go through difficult times. So the word of God reminds us that God's sovereignty is seen in creation. Secondly, God's sovereignty is demonstrated in his revelation through history. God's sovereignty is demonstrated in his revelation through history. When you look at verse 20, the Bible says this, Jeremiah 32 verse 20, you performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day, both in Israel and among all mankind and have gained the renown that is still yours. Verse 21, you brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. You know, Jeremiah is reminding the people of Exodus. Jeremiah is reminding people of that great event of how God intervened into the lives and the history of the Jewish people and brought them out from the clutches of Pharaoh and from the land of Egypt. And when you look at Jewish history, when you look at Jewish theology, Exodus was a very, very important aspect. For them, Exodus was not just another story. For them, Exodus was a focal point of reminding themselves of who God was and of how God had intervened in their lives. You know, it is said that history is often written by winners. You know, people who write history sometimes take the, take the liberty of rewriting it to suit their own needs. In our own context, we know how certain names are dropped from history, how certain kings are painted uh, in bad light just so that the other side seems to be positive. But when you read the book of Exodus, when you look at the Jewish history, the fascinating aspect is this, that the entire hero in the story of Exodus is God, not the people of Israel. The authors who wrote the book of uh, Exodus and the books that follow did not paint themselves in a very good light. In fact, they were seen as people who grumbled, people who complained, people who had little faith, but it was God who brought them through. It was God who had sustained them through. In fact, someone has rightly said that history is his story. History at the end of the day is God's story because you can see how God moves through history and how he uses historical events, how he uses historical people, even those who do not obey him or acknowledge him, you know, to fulfill God's purposes. Voltaire was a French atheist philosopher in the 18th century. And Voltaire once said that in the next 100 years, the Bible will be completely eliminated. Voltaire is dead and gone. The Bible is still around. In fact, what is interesting is the house that Voltaire uh, owned in Geneva today is owned by the Bible Society, where hundreds and thousands of Bibles are sent out all over the place. And so no matter how you look at history, you would see that behind the scenes, God is always at work. You look at the New Testament, you know, when persecution broke out, when people tried to curb the Christian faith, and as a result of persecution, the believers were scattered. Wherever they went, they preached the gospel. And rather than curbing the Christian faith, persecution acted as a catalyst through which the Christian faith uh, was spread. So God was behind even that event of persecution to bring something good. History is a reminder that God is on the throne, not just world history, but you and I can look at our own personal history. You and I can look at our own lives and see that we are where we are because of God's sovereign hand, that through the ups and the downs, through the difficult times and through the good times, God has been a good shepherd the one who has led us thus far. And if God can control history, if God can move history, then you and I can be sure that God will continue to lead us and guide us even through this difficult time. God's sovereignty is seen in creation. God's sovereignty is demonstrated in his revelation through history. 
And thirdly and finally, God's sovereignty is experienced in his relation towards us. God's sovereignty is experienced in his relation towards us. Look at verse 23. Jeremiah 32, 23 says this, They came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey you or follow your law. They did not do what you commanded to do, and so you brought all this disaster upon them. You know, as Jeremiah looks at his people, he says this, They came into the land of Egypt, they took possession of it, but they did not obey you. They did not listen to your commandments. Now, isn't it fascinating that the same God who is able to create the heavens and the earth, the same God who is able to bring the sun, the moon, and the stars into existence by the mere power of his word, the same God who is able to move through history, using even people who do not acknowledge him for his glory. When it comes to his relationship with you and me, he does not force himself on us, but rather he gives us the choice. He gives us the choice to either obey him, he gives us the choice to reject him. That God's sovereignty is undergirded by his love. He does not force himself on us. You know, and that's why the Bible tells us, you know, where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and have fellowship with him. He is more than able to break that door. He is more than able to barge in and take control. But even in his sovereignty, he gives you and me the privilege to say yes to him. He gives us the choice to say yes to him. God's sovereignty is seen in his relationship towards us, that he gives us the free will that we can either say yes or we can say no. But here's the thing, as Jeremiah reminds us, that the choices we make have consequences. Every choice we make. If we choose to live under his sovereignty, then we live with a sense of freedom. We live with a sense of security. But if we choose to reject his sovereignty, then we live in anxiety and in fear. Jeremiah was facing a difficult time in his life. And yet, because he recognized that God is sovereign over the throne, that God is sovereign over the affairs of the world, he was able to do something that maybe in the eyes of the world looked rather foolish to buy a piece of land when the enemy was at the gates, when the enemy was about to enter and destroy everything. So often what God asks of us may seem foolish to the world. And yet, at the end of the day, it all boils down to this one question. Who do you say God is in your heart? Because how you answer that question is the most important thing about you, about how you live your life. So God's sovereignty is seen in his creation. God's sovereignty is seen, is demonstrated in his revelation through history. And God's sovereignty is also experienced in his relationship towards us. It is my prayer that as we live through these uncertain times, that as we live in the midst of our fears and our doubts and our anxieties, that we would constantly lift up our eyes from our problems and see God seated on the throne, that we would see him as the one uh, who has control over the affairs of the world. And when we lift our eyes and when we fix our eyes on him, may that bring a renewed sense of peace, grace and assurance in our life that no matter what happens, no matter what is in store for us in the future, God is sovereign and he will see you through. Would you please pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder that you are a sovereign God, that, Father, nothing is difficult for you. And so, Lord, this morning we want to commit ourselves afresh into your hand. We want to commit our struggles, our difficulties, our issues that we think are so difficult into your care. And we want to exchange it for the peace and the assurance that only you can give knowing that you are sovereign, not only over the affairs of the world, but even over our personal affairs. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to speak to us, continue to draw us close to you, and, Father, that you would continue to mold us in the likeness of your Son. To that end, Father, we commit each and every one of us in your hand. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Paras and all the participants for your meaningful participation. We are blessed. God bless you in return. Well, before we close with a prayer and benediction, I want to take this privilege to thank our brother Peter, who has taken care of the worship team from the very beginning of our virtual Sunday service. He has been taking care of this uh, worship part of our service since the beginning till today. And from today onward, we want to relieve him from the responsibility from coming Sunday onward. Keso and Wang Mao will take over and carry on. Therefore, I, on behalf of the church and the leaders who entrusted you and this new leader, Wang Mao and Gesso, uh, would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for the tremendous job you have done. God bless you in return. Shall we all look to God in prayer? God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful time of worship and fellowship. Thank you for being with us from the beginning till the end. And we thank you for our brother Peter who served the church during this transitional period and during this uh, pandemic. Doing tremendous job as a worship leader and uh, worship in charge. We have nothing in return, but Lord, for all the good works he has done, may you bless him in return. We also remember our brother Doshi, who is now in Naglen because of the loss of his father. We thank you, Father, for enabling him to go and see his father's face, who departed to be with you. Today we pray for his mother and his sister and Doshi. Continue to strengthen them and help them to draw comfort from your word. Remind them that, Lord, their beloved one has gone, not forever, but for some time. And one day, they will all see each other again face to face. Thank you for what you have done in and through Jesus Christ on the cross and for the resurrection of our Lord. Because of whom and because of what he has done, we have hope even beyond this life. Thank you once again. We also pray for Nashun and his mother who are hospitalized. Father, we pray that you will be with them. We know that very less people will see them. We know that, Lord, they are feeling lonely during this time. Help them to feel your presence like never before. And Lord, may you fulfill your promises which you have in the scripture. Especially Isaiah 41 verse 10, we remember where you say not to be dismayed, not to be afraid because you are our God, because you will help us and you will uphold us with your righteous right hand. May this promise come very much alive in the lives of Nashun and his mother during this time of not uh, isolation and during this time of sickness. Please reach out with your healing touch and heal them and bring back to normal life so that they will enjoy all the blessings you have given them and they will become a great testimonies for the people and will become great source of encouragement and support for the people who would go through similar situation like they are facing, they are going through right now. We pray for the family members who are supplying all their needs and supporting them in many ways. Continue to strengthen all of them. We also pray for the doctors and the nurses. Bless them, protect them, and help them to give their best help to Nashun and his mother, Shika. We pray also for alumni, well-wishers, and all the members of NCF here in the city and also away from the city, wherever they are, bless them and keep them and protect them. And if there are 
members seek and weak. Bring healing in their lives and help them to experience your healing touch in an amazing manner so that, Lord, they will live to glorify your name and to be your witnesses wherever they are. Thank you once again for everything. Now may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and always. Amen. Thank you once again everyone for being with us in this service. See you coming Sunday. Till then, take care of yourself. God bless you. As we sing the blessing song, let us especially bless our friends who are having their birthdays, anniversaries, and who are traveling this week. I invite you all to raise your hands towards your screen and bless one another as we sing this song. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine out. That's all.